Acts chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 36 through 40. Peter said, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Today I'm going to be ministering on the subject simply, Save Yourself. Everybody say it. Save Yourself. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to go, go down this road that you want us to go. To understand what's on the inside of us, but also, Lord, where we go from here. Lord, I pray for men and women and young people that are here this, this morning. And I pray over their spirit, that their spirit would be receptive and their minds uh, would come unto, under the banner, Lord God, of the Word of God right now. Be with our children uh, as they're in classes today, Lord. Allow them to glean something that's going to they can pattern their whole life after, that they can move forward into the things of God. We pray today, God, uh, that your anointing would be released in this place uh, and drive out un every unclean spirit that has followed us in here in the name of Jesus. We drive it out by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we take authority. Uh, we take dominion. Uh, we take power over everything and anything uh, that's not like you. Uh, and God, we give you the glory and we give you all the praise and we ask you to have your way in the remainder of this service uh, in Jesus' name. Uh, can you say in Jesus' name? Amen. One more time. Go ahead and put your hands together for the Lord in this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing so long. Save yourself. Everybody said, save myself. Save myself. Yeah. We've got to get to that place where we're willing to save ourselves. One of the things that I, I want to say before we get into it is to put things into context as to how this actually came about that Peter began to preach this message. It goes all the way back some 6,000 years ago that when this guy by the name of Adam and this woman by the name of Eve, they actually ate some fruit that God told them not to eat. And when they did that, what happened, it opened a Pandora's box, if you will. In other words, sin. In other words, doing what is right and, and missing the mark. That's what sin is. Everybody say missing the mark. Sin is actually trying to aim at a bullseye and, and you just miss the bullseye. In other words, you don't hit it dead center. When man was created, they were created to hit things dead center every single time. In other words, there was no sin. There was always hitting the mark because God had planned it and made it so that they can hit the mark. But because of sin, in other words, when they ate of the fruit that Satan tempted them to take up and they ate of it, it opened their eyes. Now they began to determine what was good and what was evil. Now they started saying, I believe this is right and that is right. I'll be just like God and make decisions for myself. So now sin entered uh, and because of one man's sin, according to Romans chapter 5, uh, because of one man's sin, because of one man's sin, it passed upon all men. For all of us have sinned now and come short of the glory of God. Every single person that is born in the world is born into sin. In other words, missing the mark. We all miss the mark. In other words, we have, are considered sinners. So now that it has passed upon all men, the Bible says this, that there became enmity between God and man. Now the Lord had prophesied way back in Genesis that he's going to bring forth a Savior and the Savior was going to crush the head of the serpent and the serpent was going to bruise his heel. He was prophesying about the Messiah or someone that was to come. We ultimately know him as the Son of God. We, he was to come and he was to deal with this sin problem. So of course many of you, some of you may not know, but many of you know that this man by the name of Jesus was born 
in a little manger. And when he was born, he was not only born as a baby, but he was born as the Messiah or the anointed one or the one that was to come, the Son of God. He was actually, as the scripture tells us, he was God with us. In other words, God come to us in human form. To wit, God was in, Christ, in Jesus Christ reconciling the world to himself. Uh, when you see Jesus, you see God. So now that God actually, the, we call it the incarnation, uh, when the incarnation happened, when God became a man, what happened is uh, he came for a couple of reasons, but one of them was, was to deal with this sin problem. Uh, in other words, uh, to get sin uh, and to deal with it and destroy its uh, effects on humankind. Uh, on humankind, that means the death, the natural death that passed upon them, but also the spiritual death or the separation between us and God. So what had to happen? Blood had to be shed by this individual. Why? Because from the beginning of time, there were animals that had to be sacrificed uh, to, to, to allow us and God to have this communion that was needed. Uh, lambs and bulls and goats and all kinds of stuff. Turtle doves had to be sacrificed. But now that Jesus has come, he was going to enter in one time and offer himself as the Lamb of God. Even when his, his, his cousin saw him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He had to get on a cross, and he had to die, and he had to shed his blood, and he had to allow his blood to atone or to take care of the sin problem. So he did that. And we all know that, many of us know, that he went into a grave. And he was put in a borrowed tomb. And there he's laid in that tomb for three days. And in three days, he rose again the third day, conquering death and the grave. So now that he's done that, the sin problem that we have has been dealt with in him. And now we can draw nigh to God or near to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's very important that the blood be applied to your life. The Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness or taking away of sin. Blood has to be shed. So now that he, he died and that he rose again, he was buried and he rose again the third day, here he is and he showed himself alive to different folks and let them know, I have risen from the dead. But he came to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, leading up to where we're at. In Acts chapter 1, he came to his disciples and he spent 40 days with them talking to them about the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He talked to them about important things, things that are necessary, things that they need to be prepared for. We, we don't even know everything that he talked to them about, but here's what he did say. He said, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with, from, with power from on high. He said, John truly baptized my, my, my cousin. He truly baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost uh, not many days hence. In, uh, in other words, not many days from now there's going to be a spirit that comes upon you the Holy Spirit and he's going to baptize you and when he baptizes you you're going to know that he baptized there's not going to be any doubt about it that he baptized he says so so wait in Jerusalem until this happens to you and so they stayed there and and and, and tarried there and, and the feast of Pentecost was just around the corner and they're waiting in this upper room there's about 120 of them at this time and they're waiting in this upper room for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they didn't know it have any idea what to expect all they they knew that they would know that the Spirit had come upon them when it happened. So here they are waiting, uh, and they're, they're in this upper room. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, in the beginning of this chapter, it says, that, and then suddenly when the day of Pentecost had fully come, in other words, their harvest and everything had come in, it's a feast day that they have, the 50th day, that's what Pentecost means, the 50th day. It says when the day of Pentecost had fully come, suddenly there came a sound from heaven, not from hell, not from their inner man, man or anything, but a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire it wasn't fire but it was like fire and it sat upon each of them and the Bible says and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance in other words glossolalia broke out and they began to speak in tongues they started speaking in a native tongue which they had never learned and here these 120 are walking through the streets speaking in tongues for the very 
very first time, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb and he left, but he had never been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Samson, the great Samson, had the ability to raid, raid, tear out city gates and put them on top of a mountain. And the Bible said the Spirit of God came upon him, but he had never been baptized in the Holy Ghost. We see that Elizabeth, John the baptizer's father and his mother, Elizabeth and John, I mean Elizabeth and whatever his dad's name was, he, they, had, they, had, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, but none of them had been baptized in the Holy Ghost. This was the first group of individuals that had ever been baptized in the Holy Ghost. There was a lot of filling going on, but this was the first time an overflowing or a baptism, a totally immersion, or a dipping under, a totally getting wet in the Spirit, inside and out, fully, all the way. Some of you might have been filled with the Holy Ghost before you came into this service, but God wants to baptize you in the Holy Ghost. And so it happened. And all that they were walking through the streets, there were all kinds of folks that had come for the Feast of Pentecost to, to celebrate the celebration and to, 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 for the ingathering and all that and the harvest. They were just excited. But they saw them speaking in different languages and there were all kinds of people there from all around, different nationalities and tongues. And they heard them speak in their native tongue in these Galileans which they had never been born. He said, aren't all these which speak of ignorant men, Galileans, how hear we speak, uh, hear them speak uh, the wonderful things of God uh, in our native language. Uh, they never learned this. Uh, and they said they must be drunk. Uh, they must be full of new wine. Uh, and, and they thought they were just babbling. Uh, and, but Peter with the eleven stood up and opened their mouths and said, These men are not drunk, as ye suppose, because it's only 9 a.m. in the morning. It's only the third hour of the day. There's no way that they would start drinking at this time. But this is that which was spoken by your prophet, talking about Joel. In the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream dreams. And your young men are going to see visions. And upon my servants in those days will I pour out of my spirit. He's talking about a day that we're experiencing right now. For the first time, the Spirit of God was being poured out. And then he began to preach. Peter began to preach to them about who this Jesus was. How that Jesus overcame death and the grave. How that David prophesied about Jesus. And how David said that Jesus would sit on the throne of David forever. And that God would make him both Lord, Master, and Christ, Messiah. This is where he's at. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord, Curios, Master, and Christ, Christos, Messiah. One of the hardest things to do sometimes is to convince people that they need to be saved. Or rescued. Some people just don't even know that they need to be rescued. Or they need to be saved. I, I'm doing okay. But today we're going to talk to you and help you to understand uh, that you need to be saved. I need to be saved. Uh, we need to be saved. Uh, and there is a way to be saved. Everybody say amen. amen. A successful rescuer. I want to talk about three things here today. A successful rescuer is dependent upon three things. Number one, a successful rescue is dependent upon making contact with your rescuer. Making contact with your rescuer. Eye contact, physical contact, being able to reach out and grab hold of someone that's trying to rescue you. We see this guy by the name of the, uh, we call him the uh, uh, Ethiopian eunuch. He was over the treasury of the queen and, and he was just traveling back from Jerusalem, going back to his home state. And as he was traveling, he was reading a book that he didn't even understand. He had never made contact with the one who wrote this book or whoever this book was about. He was just reading his book, but the Holy Ghost spoke to Philip, who was called the evangelist. And he said, go join yourself to this chariot out in the desert. 
So he was having great revival in Samaria at the time, but here he left Samaria, a great revival to go to one man. Do you know that God will come to wherever you're at if you're hungry and you're desiring to, to know him? He'll come right, he'll leave the 90 and 9 and then he'll go after the one. He'll leave the great revivals and go after one individual. If you're hungry, I'm talking to some people today. Uh, if you're hungry and you desire to be filled with God's Spirit, uh, I'm telling you, He'll come into that place where you're at uh, and He'll fill you. Uh, he'll change your life. Uh, he'll make you a new man uh, or a new woman. Uh, it depends upon the hunger that's on the inside uh, of your soul, uh, on the inside uh, of your heart. 1986, there I was sitting in a room uh, all by myself. I had my service revolver on my leg. I was in the military at the time. I worked with the NIS department at the time. And I had that right there. And I was working undercover for about a year in this one operation. And I knew I was going to be there for a year. And I didn't have the friendships and everything that I really wanted to have. And I was associating with people that I really didn't want to associate with. I was very lonely. And I was very bored in one sense. And I remember taking that weapon off my leg. And I was just kind of feeling a little bit lonely and playful at the time. And I emptied out all the shells out of that 138 snub nose revolver. And I took it and I closed it back up. I made sure there was nothing in it and this is something that you should never do and I knew that I should never do I've been trained not to do stuff like this but here I was playing in my room with my own revolver and I closed it up and I put it to my head and I said God if I really want to not to say God but I said if I really want to do this I can do this and I pulled the trigger that moment my eyes began to just focus on something more than was just right here I knew I had some issues. And about a week later, I'm in the same room and I'm just talking to God. And I had some relationship with God six and a half years prior to that. But I was not serving the Lord at all, not even a little. Didn't have Christian friends. Didn't have anybody talk to me about church or wanting to go to church or anything like that. And I just knelt down. I'm telling you about hunger. 1986, hunger desire and I remember kneeling down next to my bed uh, and I began to pray uh, and I lifted up my hands uh, and I said God uh, I don't know what it is I need uh, but whatever it is I need uh, I need it from you right now it felt like a covering come over this is my testimony it felt like a covering uh, come over my room uh, I don't know what it was but now I know what it was uh, it was the Holy Ghost uh, that was coming over and overshadowing uh, my room uh, and when I began to pray in English uh, my language changed uh, I knew I was getting to say something different but my language changed and I started speaking in another language which I had never learned I did it for about three seconds and I opened my eyes and I said man because somebody had told me this six and a half years ago about it and I said this is what and I did not believe it but this is what that guy was talking about change my entire life Till today in 2019 changed the course of everything that I was about and where I was going and, and there's all kinds of things if you if you ever make this change and, and you ever make this decision there's all kinds of things that you're going to have to go through you'll you'll receive all kinds of persecutions and all kinds of things that are going to try and take you back but I'm telling you it's worth the journey uh, it's worth the fight uh, and God will come after you if he sees hunger and a desire uh, he they that do hunger and desire for righteousness uh, the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 5 they shall be filled God is going to fill you if you're desirous and you're hungry for the things of God. So here, here's Philip running alongside this chariot. And he sees this Ethiopian eunuch reading this scripture. He was the Bible. It was a scroll. He said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, how can I understand if someone, if someone teach me? So he invited him into the chariot and they went down the road and he began to preach to him. He actually read it, read it from the scripture. He went to Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7 through 8. And this is what it says in the original. It says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears dumb. He, is, he, ha, he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and 
from judgment. We know who that is, but he didn't know who that was. And who, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. In Acts chapter 8, verse 34, here's the response of the Ethiopian eunuch. He said, I pray thee, of whom? Of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Philip was able to put the eunuch in contact with the rescuer. He was able to connect him. If you're going to be rescued, you've got to come in contact with the rescuer. You've got to come in contact with the Savior. You've got to come in contact with the one that's able to save you in the first place. In verse 36 of our scripture text, Peter said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord, Curios, Master, and Christ, Christo, Messiah, or the Savior of the world. The one we're trying to get you in contact with right now is not religion, not Lighthouse of the Valley, not some other church, but we're trying to get you in contact with Jesus. Oh, once you know him, you'll never be the same. Oh, you may only know church, but once you know Jesus, you'll never be the same. You may know the pastor, but once you know Jesus, you'll never be the same. You may know your wife or your husband or your children who have led you here, but once you know Jesus and you really get in contact with him. I was talking with Brother Tekla Marin. He's, he, he has led the greatest revival in Africa that's ever been seen. Uh, and he was staying at my house one time uh, and we were talking uh, and just having a communion. Uh, and I asked him about his experience uh, of how he first came to the Lord uh, and how he ended up uh, preaching the gospel that we're preaching right now. He said that he was already a preacher. He was already doing the will of God, he felt. Uh, and all of a sudden, he said, Jesus appeared to him. And I'm going to tell you why he appeared to him like this. Because one, number one, he was an apostle. He didn't claim to be an apostle, but he was. And he had a work for him to do in Ethiopia. And he came to the Lord. And the Lord said, you need to put me on. He said, what do you mean? And he said, the Lord unzipped himself. And said, put me on. On. He said, I understood that, that I need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. I don't know who it was that baptized him, but he sought him out and he had them dip him. Although he was already a preacher, although baptized, although walking with God the way that the Lord was leading him already, he understood there's more that I need. There's something that I need for the will of God to be done in my life and to go as far. Some of you are just content of where you are right now, but God wants to take you a lot farther. Some of you have the knowledge that you feel is good enough uh, but God is saying there's so much more you can be so comfortable with religion uh, you can be so comfortable with your experience uh, but God says uh, what about what I have for you this is who G uh, Peter was talking to in John chapter 14 verse 6 the amplified Jesus says it like this I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life no one comes to the Father but through me you gotta make contact if I'm gonna be rescued if you're gonna be rescued if we're gonna be saved we've gotta make contact with the one who's trying to save us a successful rescue is dependent also on number two by upon believing that your rescuer has the ability to save you. Does your rescuer have the ability to get you out of your situation? Years ago, I was in Hawaii. When I, I wasn't even saved, but I was in Hawaii. And I'm just out there swimming, snorkeling looking at the reef, beautiful fish. I had never really seen that before. Beautiful parrotfish and all kinds of tropical fish and 
everything. They were along the reef. And somehow at the time of day that I was out there, I, the tide was either going out or whatever you want to say, but it just rose. And it took me over the reef. And I, I was so transfixed at what I, what I was looking at that I didn't realize that I went over the reef and I started going to the open water. But I got my fins on and I'm just got my little snorkel in the air and I'm just looking at these fish. But I noticed that the fish were getting bigger. They were like that, like that. Now they're like this. And fat. <laughs> they can take a bite out of you or something. But they were getting bigger and it was getting murky. I couldn't see the bottom anymore. And, I, and, and then I noticed I was kind of like doing like this in the water. So I happened to look up and I noticed that I had went over the reef and I'm going out to sea like Nemo. <laughs> the drop off. <laughs> The drop off. And I'm going out to sea. And I'm like, my heart started panting, and I'm thinking, I'm going to drown out here. And I'm like, I better get back in. But something told me. And, and, and remember, no Holy Ghost, nothing. But I believe it was the Lord. The Lord said, Look out to sea. And I looked way out there. Not as far as I could see, but it was out there. And I saw these little fingers. And I'm like, and I forgot about myself for a minute. And I saw these little fingers sticking up. And then I saw a hand and an arm. And I said, that's a person. And just instinctively, because that's just my nature, not this, but it's the nature is to help people. Just instinctively. I start swimming all the way out there, and I've got my little fins going, and I'm getting out. I got this. Finally, I got out there, and, and it was this little lady. She was no more than about this big. I found out later she was about this big. But she was a little old tiny lady. And as soon as I got up her, she grabbed me around my head and took me. both started going down. She had me around the neck. And she's taking me down. And, and thank God she was that little because I was able to rip her off my body, take her off my little uh, speedo body, and just... <laughs> Rip her off. And, and, and because of the fins, I was able to flap back up to the top. As soon as we came up, I yelled at her like this. I said, lady, I'm a rescue swimmer. I'm not a rescue swimmer. But that's what I said. I was trying to get her to believe that I can help her. And, and only, only, only rescue swimmers, I knew some guys that were in my squadron at one time, I knew they were rescue swimmers, that's what they did. And, and I was trying to get her confidence that, hey, you know, I can help you. And when I brought her up, she just kind of looked at me and, and said, okay, okay. And she didn't have any uh, flippers on, maybe she did in the beginning. Oh, she had these little booties and, and that was just it. And I said, I just need you to lay back. And I saw this on, on some movie or something like that. I just need you to lay back and I'm going to take you in. Uh, uh. Still in one of these numbers. So <laughs> we get all the way in, and she didn't even say thank you. She just took off running as soon as she hit the ground. Just took off. Didn't even say, I don't even know who she was. My point you have to believe that the rescuer is able and has the ability to save you. Otherwise, you could be caught in that situation. Notice what in verse 37 of our scripture text, Jewish response to, to Peter's message about who Jesus is. It says, now when they heard this about him being the Messiah and the Lord, uh, they were pricked in their heart. They were cut to the very core and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, uh, men and brethren, uh, what shall we do? They literally and actually believed uh, that Jesus had the ability to save them uh, at this time. Uh, there's something about when you really come in contact with him. Uh, and if there's really going to be a, a belief system on the inside of you, you've got to believe that whatever situation uh, that you are in right now, God is able to rescue you. God is able to save you. Oh, I'm, I'm too bad, preacher. I've done too much. No, 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 no. You haven't done too much. I uh, haven't seen too much. Uh, you haven't been involved in too much. Uh, the Lord, uh, I don't care if you were sitting on death row right now. The Lord uh, is able to save you. I don't care what you're going through. The Lord is able to rescue you. But you've got to believe it. You've got to believe that there's hope for me too. 
Notice what the apostle said. Paul said this in Romans chapter 10, verse 13 through 14. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But notice, here's the, here's the deal. But how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? In other words, I need some preachers in the house of God to stand to your feet and begin to proclaim I'm going to take this message. I'm going to rescue. Some, I'm going to help God out here. It's not just because, uh, it's not just because, uh, now, now everyone should be standing. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, you're a preacher. I'm not talking about because you have the credentials. Uh, I'm not talking about because you have the license. Uh, I'm not talking about just because uh, you've been ordained by someone laying hands on you. I'm talking about God has called you uh, and God has called you to himself and he has sent you into this dying world. They're going to hear from you. You may be seated. Our job is not only to get people in contact with Jesus, uh, but to convince them that, they, that he has the ability to save them. Uh, notice this. Uh, Paul and Silas convinced uh, the Philippian jailer that Jesus could save him. Uh, Peter convinced Cornelius uh, and his household uh, that Jesus could save him. Priscilla and Qu Aquila, the husband and wife team, convinced uh, Apollos uh, that Jesus could save him, uh, and he was rebaptized. Uh, Philip convinced uh, the city of Samaria and Simon the sorcerer that Jesus could save him uh, and he was baptized uh, and filled uh, with the Holy Ghost. Uh, I'm telling you something. Uh, if you can just help God out here and just say, I'm going to tell people. I'm telling you, how are they going to hear? They're not all going to come to Lighthouse of the Valley. They're not all going to turn on some television. Uh, they're not all going to hear somebody preaching uh, in a church. Uh, it's because you have come alive. Uh, you have come alive. Uh, you understand what God has. That's why I haven't shut my mouth since 1986. Uh, it cost me something uh, on my job. Uh, it cost me something with my peers. It cost me something with those that I ran with. It cost me something, but I'll tell you what, I have not shut my mouth from that day. Not so I can get a pulpit, but so I can just tell the message. I went to the parks. I went to the prisons. I went to those that nobody else wanted to go to. I went to the retirement homes. I went to home Bible studies. I had five, six home Bible studies in my house every week. Why? Because I wanted people to know what I've got. I believe what i got. I came in contact with this Jesus, and I believed that he was able to help me out and he did and I know that the only way he's going to help somebody is he's going to send you and me you can sit back all you want in your luxury chair at your house. Uh, you can sit back and say, I'm going to let the preachers uh, that are ordained to do it. Uh, uh, you can sit back and say, that's somebody else's job. Uh, you can do like Bishop Haney used to just uh, uh, take that mantle up uh, and say, uh, oh, everybody's business uh, is nobody's business uh, and nobody's going to see that I'm not doing uh, what the Lord's. I'm telling you, the Lord sees in secret uh, and he's watching over you. Uh, he's the one that called you. Pastor didn't call you. Uh, Jesus called you. Uh, and now that Jesus has called you, he said, go! into the whole world and preach the gospel. Go and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That name Jesus. Go and make disciples of, of all men. Preach the gospel to every creature. If the only people that are listening is a roach, preach to the roaches. We must convince people that Jesus has the ability to save them only because of the price he paid on Calvary's tree. A successful rescue is dependent upon a willingness to help yourself. Not only coming in contact with the one that's able to help you and save you and rescue you. Not only believing that he's able to do what he says by saving you. He has the ability but also, you have to get this, a willingness to help yourself. We must grab the lifeline that is thrown out to us. You got to be willing to grab the lifeline. That, that lifeline is going out right now, I'm telling you. But if you're not willing to grab that lifeline... You can remain in your situation 
until Jesus comes back. 1987, I think it was. I was over at Miramar. No, it wasn't 87. It was in, later than that. Get my dates mixed up. But I was in Miramar. I was told I was going to go to swim survival school. Only because I was going to be flying helicopters for some things. Not because I was an air crewman. But they wanted me, the commander said, I want you to go to swim survival school. All right. I can swim. <laughs> All the air crew guys are saying, man, let me show you what to do when you get over there. I said, you know what I tell me? I mean, I was on a swim team in high school. I can swim. <laughs> I can swim. Don't worry about it. I'm going to get through this little swim school that you guys have been through. They already knew what I was going to face when I get there. So I go over to Miramar, and I'm over there and going through all their training and everything and all that. And then they said, here's what we, one of the things we want you to do. And you can't fail any of these things. So we, we need you to tread water for five minutes. <laughs> Sergeant Diaz, Staff Sergeant Diaz. <laughs> he knows how hard it is. He's a, he's a, uh, has a helicopter team that he, so I'm sure he's been through this type of training. And so I'm in the water, all the flight gear on and boots. It's different when you got flight gear on boots and all that stuff. And I'm in there treading water, and as soon as I hit the water, Sergeant, I'm like. <laughs> I am struggling to stay up. That water was right here. This is the first 30 seconds. And in my mind, I'm calculating five minutes. And I'm like, oh, no, I can't make this. And I'm barely trying to get out of the water. I'm trying to breathe. And, and I'm struggling. And I'm, I can see guys. You know, it's like 20 of us. Uh, and I can see guys all around in the pool. This is a pool. <laughs> this isn't open water. This is just a swimming pool. And I'm just trying to stay alive. And, I'm, and they're just looking at me. <laughs> like turtles, man. They're just like. Looking at me, this smooth. <laughs> and I remember about a minute and a half into it, I saw the instructor. He was about from here to where that pulpit is. And he's looking at me because he see I'm struggling. And I see him. And he said, do you need help? <laughs> and I said, if I say yeah. They're going to pull me out, and I'm going to fail, and all that. I said, but I'm dying. And I'm going, I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he threw out the stick. He said, grab the stick. And I had a choice. Either drown, <laughs> trying to be proud, trying to be arrogant, trying to act like I know it all. See, that the Lord is extending a, 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 a rope, a stick, a, an extension to somebody in this room. But you, you're so proud. You're, you're so full of yourself. You're so full of life. And, and you think you know it all uh, that you won't even grab the end of that rope. Uh, and he put that stick out there. Man, I grabbed that thing uh, and he pulled me out. And he said, come on, everybody, take a break. I said, we're not taking a break. I'm done. I'm D-O-R. Drop on request. I'm not getting back in the water. <laughs> I'm not going back in. He said, you sure you want to D.O.R.? I'm sure. I got back to my command. Got back to my command. They said, we hear you D.O.R. Said, get yourself two months. Get ready to go back. I said, Commander, I don't, I don't want to go back. I don't, I don't need to find these help. I don't need to go back. And so he said, you're going back. Nobody D.O.R.s. And so I said, all right. So who did I go to? I went to the guys that had made it, those air crew guys. I said, guys, show me how to do this. They took me to the pool. And they showed me there's certain ways you do it when you got a full gear on that you're supposed to do and you relax when you're in there. And I got that stroke down so good, I went back to Miramar again a couple months later and when I jumped in that pool, I was just as smooth. <laughs> Pushing that water down and coming to the top. And I remember looking over and there was this one guy over in that corner there, he was going. <laughs> I feel you, brother. But my point is this, the Lord is extending something to somebody in this place. But you have to be willing to accept the help. You have to be willing to grab it. 
You have to be willing to get it. You know, there was a time when Israel had sinned and they had done so, so wickedly in the Lord's sight uh, that he sent serpents among them uh, and the serpents started biting them uh, and they started dying by the thousands. Uh, and here they are dying uh, and, they, and Moses interceded for the people and he said, Lord, uh, lift this plague off of them. Uh, so the Lord did uh, and he said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a brazen serpent uh, and you know that rod that you lifted up uh, over the Red Sea, uh, I want you to put a brazen certain serpent uh, on that rod uh, and I want you to lift it up uh, among the people said everybody who looks at the rod uh, and just gazes at the rod uh, they're going to live but those that do not look at the rod uh, they're going to die do you know there were people that wouldn't even look at the rod uh, and all they had to do was look see God is extending something to somebody this morning he said all you got to do is grab hold of what the preacher is preaching today all you got to do is be obedient to, to what he's extending you today and you'll live but if you wanted to stay in the state that you're in don't do anything don't do anything. The lifeline is being thrown out to us. Peter said in, in verse 38 and 40 of our scripture text, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to them that are far off and to all that are far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call and with many other words uh, did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward or this corrupt or this uh, crooked or perverse generation God is throwing out the lifeline but he says you have to save yourself, first of all, by changing your mind, repenting. Repentance means I'm having a radical change of mind. Why is it radical? Because from a baby or whatever age you are, from a child uh, that you have been just bombarded uh, with all kinds of stuff in the way that things are, your lifestyle, everything that's going on uh, and your mind uh, has been filled with so many things. Uh, and the first thing that needs to happen uh, is you need to repent. Uh, in other words, uh, if you're going to grab this lifeline, uh, God is going to extend it to you, but you've got to save yourself. It's your part. Uh, God not going to do it for you. It's your part uh, that you're willing to repent. Change your mind. I want God, preacher, but I don't want to change the way I think. God's throwing out a lifeline. If we're going to accept it and God is throwing out a lifeline, we not only need to repent, but the Bible tells us we have to have a changing of the way we think. Things have to just begin to come new. We've got to take on a new way of thinking. God's throwing out the lifeline, but he says to us, number two, that we've got to change our lifestyle. The way we live. The way I've been living, preacher. My lifestyle, my daily lifestyle. And the best way to do that, to start that, is to go into the waters of baptism. Uh, the Bible says uh, that old things are going to pass away uh, and all things uh, are going to become new. Uh, you're going to become a new man. Uh, God is throwing out the lifeline. Uh, he said, but what you need to do uh, is you need to repent, uh, but you need to take yourself and go into the water. I don't want to get wet. Uh, I just got my weave done. <laughs> Nothing wrong with a weave. I may need one. I don't want to get fully wet. Can you just sprinkle me a little? Can you just pour a little water over me? It says to be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Uh, not some of you, uh, but every one of you. Uh, not just a few of you, but, but all of you. Uh, if you're believing uh, that God is the one that you're, is reaching out to you, and you believe that he has the power to do everything that he says he's going to do uh, and to save you, then you need to believe also that he's throwing out this lifetime to you, and this lifeline uh, is going to be appropriated uh, when you turn uh, in your mind, uh, and when you take a new lifestyle, uh, and the best way uh, that you take a new lifestyle is you say everything uh, that followed me because of the baptismal right behind here. Everything uh, that has followed me uh, in this water, I'm going to leave uh, in this water. I'm talking about girlfriends, boyfriends, uh, and all kinds of friends. Uh, I'm going to leave them in this water. I'm talking about a lifestyle of drinking and drugs. Uh, and I want to keep my doobie though, Lord. Oh, no, you can't have none of it. Uh, it's all going in the water, and you got to make up your mind, I'm going to change. 
one of the hardest things to do when I went in the water was to take the black book with me. Those of you who don't know the black book, phone numbers of various people. Some of you go down in the water and you hold that black book above the water. Mm. <laughs> First time I came to a church after I received the Holy Ghost in my testimony, this year, I came in with a woman. I just met her the night before I went to church. I woke up, I said, you want to go to church? She's like, because God was dealing with me. I had the Holy Ghost, but I was still doing that. Does he want to go to church? Says, yeah. <laughs> she wasn't even interested in church. We went to church, and I sat in that pew, and I listened to that preacher. And I'm just listening to him. And I said in my mind, this is done. I didn't even know how to do all the things I needed to do. But here's what I said in my mind. I will never, ever, ever go out with another woman. This is a 26 years old now. Hormones were way up there at this point. Got to draw the picture. <laughs> I said, I will never, ever go out with another woman that's not in church living for God. And I had never, ever, ever been out with a woman that's living for God and in church. But I made that statement with that woman sitting next to me because I knew I'm going to be a different man. I'm going to be a different man. Lifestyle change. Some of you want the old lifestyle to come with you into church. And God is saying, you got to let the lifestyle. you got to repent. You have to have this radical change of mind. You have to change your thinking. But you got to change your lifestyle. The, the life road, lifeline is being set out there. But you got to be willing to change the lifestyle. The second thing when he throws that, third thing that happens when he throws that lifeline out is you have to be willing to change your spiritual condition. See, because you've repented, you've come into church, you've been in the waters of baptism, but you're not willing to take that lifeline of getting the Holy Ghost. But you'll, you'll, you'll replace. That's, that's God's business. He's going to baptize me. Yes, he's going to extend the line. But you've got to use your voice. You've got to be willing to speak the words. God's not going to speak the words for you. He's going to give you the ability. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. The Holy Ghost is going to be extended to you. But it's you that's going to have to be willing to allow your tongue to speak the words. So when you're at an altar or you're praying for the Holy Ghost, you can't sit there like this. Open your mouth and began to speak uh, and have faith that God's going to fill you uh, with the baptism uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Lord is going to do it. Uh, he's extending the, the line to you. He's throwing out the rope to you. He's extending help to you. He's extending salvation to you. But you've got to be willing. He said, save yourselves. By changing your spiritual condition. All of these take me doing something. See, faith and obedience go together. You can't say, I believe, but you never do anything with it. And believing is not just good enough when you repent. Believing is not just good enough when you go in the waters. Believing also extends that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you believe that you can receive it, but then you've got to receive it, and you've got to take it, and you've got to grab it, and you've got to be tearing at an altar. You've got to believe that God's going to do something. I'm going to let my voice, I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise you, and I don't even have the Holy Ghost yet. I'm going to praise you and I'm going to honor you and I'm going to believe that you're going to fill me and at one moment I'm going to tell you what's going to happen at one moment and a split of time God's going to break through and he's going to fill you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost but he's going to expect you he's going to expect me to start speaking the words that he puts in my mouth without fear and favor of man that I speak it out And the final thing, as the Lord throws out the lifeline to you, he wants you to 
save yourself by changing the perversion of this generation, walking away from the perversion of this generation. Save yourselves from the perversion of this generation. In other words, uh, you can be filled, you can be baptized, you can be totally walking with God, but yet you're still in the world. When he wrote these things in the Corinthians and stuff, he said, come out from among ye them and be ye separate. Uh, he was not talking to sinners, uh, but he was talking to saints uh, that were operating in the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, he was talking to those uh, that have been living for God for a long time. Uh, he said, come out from among them uh, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, uh, and touch not the unclean thing. Uh, be ye holy, for I am holy. Be ye separate, uh, for I am holy. Be separate, saith the Lord. Uh, he's telling you, uh, I want you to save yourself. Uh, I need you to save yourself from this untoward, from this perverse, from this crooked generation. I need you to save yourself. In other words, you've got to make up your mind that you're coming out of the world. You're going to be in the world, but not of the world. You're no longer going to run in this direction any longer. You're not going to live a double life. You're not going to be hot one minute and cold the next minute. You're not going to be in the church and out of the church. You're not going to be in the church and tomorrow on the dance floor because it's a veterans day. No, you're going to be in the church uh, no matter where you go uh, the lifeline uh, that he's sending out to you is going to be taken uh, but you've got to do something about it uh, you've got to save yourself wake up and look around you and say am I running with the right crowd hmm this is like Peter you know hanging around the fire I can feel Peter because I, I, I can identify with the, the bad side of Peter. He's hanging around the fire. In his mind, he knows this is, I'm done. Me and Jesus aren't even on the same page anymore. I've denied him three times already like he said I would do. He's hanging around the fire. And someone asked him, aren't you, aren't you one of those disciples? Nope. Not me. Yeah, 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 I know you. You're one of them. No. And they told him, your speech betrays you. See, what my point is, that here you are, living for God, walking with God, I don't know how many years or days or whatever it is you've been walking with him, but you're still running with the crowd around the fire. They know something's different about you. And if you keep on telling and denying and, and still making compromises, they're just going to accept you notice. Uh, they're going to accept you around the fire. They're going to leave you alone. In other words, you're going to let a few things come out of your mouth. You're going to let a few things happen around your life. They're going to say, oh, yeah, you're still one of us. This is where Peter was. Uh, he was totally in the Lord. He was totally a disciple of Jesus Christ. Uh, and here it was uh, that he should have been standing for the Lord. Uh, and because of the actions uh, and the stuff that was coming out of his mouth, uh, they accepted, accepted, accepted him in that little group around the fire. People will be so happy to see you come back. Welcome back. Those dreams that you used to. You know, welcome back. The same old place that you laughed about. For the dreams have all changed since you come around. Some of you are old enough to know welcome back, Carter. <laughs> but God is extending the lifeline. Devils rejoice when one sinner falls. Heaven rejoices over one sinner that repenteth. There's always a copycat in the underworld for what God is doing in the life everlasting. And as we all stand around this place right now, I'm going to go let you eat your chicken. But before I do, I want to ask you, is there somebody in this place that God is extending this lifeline to? If that's you, 
You won't be afraid. You won't be ashamed. But you'll say, you're talking to me, preacher. See, I, I, don't, I don't preach to get a rise or to get accolades. Never have, probably never will, in Jesus' name. But what I do preach for is to see folks saved. So if you're in this place today and you're drowning, you need to be rescued. You're hurting. You're in an abusive situation. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. Things aren't going right. Life is coming in on you. You don't know what to do. I'm not just giving you rhetoric. I'm giving you something that's proven. Take the lifeline. If that's you, I want you to come stand with me at this altar. Take the lifeline. Take the lifeline. You want the Lord to rescue you. Maybe you're going through a situation right now. And the only hope that you have is Jesus. And you're willing to take the lifeline. Come on. The Lord is here. He's extending a help. But there's something you got to do. you got to save yourself. You've got to participate. You can't pay the price. He's already done that. But what you can do is recognize him. What you can do is believe that he has the ability to do what he said he would do. What you can do is understand that God has your best interest in mind. He's going to help you. You've got to take the lifeline. You gotta take the lifeline. I know you're hurt. There's some for hurting folks in here, and I don't know all the answers, but I do know the one who has the answers. And I believe that He gave me this message not just so that we can go through it and that's just the way it is. No, 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 no. He knew who would be in this place today, and there's somebody that may be on the edge of suicide, but the Lord says, "Take the lifeline. Repent." have a radical change of mind. Some of you need to go into the waters of baptism today. Put on the new man. New lifestyle. New lifestyle. Some of you need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Spiritual transformation happening right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed, begin to call on the name of the Lord. With your own voice, I hear weeping over there, but weeping will endure for the night, but joy is going to come in the morning, daughter. They that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's going to rescue you out of your dilemma, out of your problem, out of your situation. The Lord is assuredly the one that we come to. He's not only our master and Lord, He's not only God, but He's our Savior. He's our Deliverer. He is Christ to us. He is God with us. He is never going to leave you alone. Son, He's going to be with you. Just call on His name. See, you've got to enter into that place. Uh, and as you hear people praying, uh, even people praying in tongues, uh, some of you are going to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Uh, as you begin to call on His name, uh, go ahead and receive it right now. You've been desiring it. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you serve the Lord. You could be your first day ever walking in a church and the Lord can fill you and baptize you right now. All you need to do is say, forgive me, Lord. I'm a sinner, but I need to be saved. And now you're going to be a candidate to receive this spirit that we're talking about. The Lord is coming into your life. Call on his name. That's it. Let that sound in this room begin to reverberate from the walls and everywhere in here. There are angels. I'm telling you, there are angels. Some of you already know that. But there are angels that are walking in this place and moving around here right now. They are given charge over them that fear God. There's a lot of people that have reverence for God in this place. 
There's a lot of people that fear God and take him seriously at his word in this place. Therefore, angels are here right now. They're giving charge over you. They're watching over you. They're watching over your children. But God is extending a, a lifeline to somebody. God is extending a lifeline to somebody. Save yourself. Take it. Save yourself. Lord, give me a new spiritual condition. Lord, let me be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now is your time. Now is your time. Now is your time. Today is your day. Right now, in the name of Jesus, receive it in the name of the Lord. That's it. Those of you that are veterans in the Spirit, begin to intercede right now. Those of you that know how to intercede in the Spirit, somebody's soul is in balance right now. Somebody's destiny is in question right now. And God has sent us to them right now. It may be one person. It may be a hundred people. I don't know. But Lord knows. In the name of Jesus. Lord God begin to move. 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 Somebody needs to take that lifeline. And take it for what it's worth. And begin to say Lord. I don't know what's on the other end. But I want to know you. I want to connect with you you. Uh, Lord, I want to know that you're able to do exceeding uh, abundantly above everything you said uh, and I've ever asked or thought. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, Lord, let me take that lifeline. Uh, somebody's reaching and grabbing the lifeline. Uh, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord. Uh, that's it. Call on his name. Watch him work out things in your life. Uh, come out from among them uh, and this perverse generation, uh, the crookedness of it all, the perversion of it all. Uh, I'm giving up some things. Uh, I'm walking away from some things. Uh, I'm not indulging in some things any longer. I'm going to listen to the preacher. I'm going to take his advice. Uh, I'm going to watch his example and uh, not make some of the mistakes uh, that he has made. Come on, young people. You're young. Serve the Lord while you're young. Give Him everything you've got while you're young. Turn your world right side up while you're young. Go into your schools and into your colleges and just begin to do the work of an evangelist. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. Begin to call on His name and let the Lord have His way. Jesus. Now, if you can, if you can, if you can, right here. Listen. Listen, folks. If you can do this, link up with someone next to you. Maybe just touch them on the shoulder and begin to help them. Pray with them. Swim alongside of them. Intercede for them. Help them to connect to that lifeline. Help them to connect to the Holy Ghost. Some of them, one of them may need to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Pray them through right now. Some of them might need to put on Christ and go into the waters of baptism. Uh, pray for them that God would give them that new life right now. Some of them need a change into the mind. Uh, pray that their mind would be radically changed uh, right now. Some of them need to come out of the world uh, and begin to serve the Lord. Uh, even though they're Christians, uh, tell them uh, and speak into their life uh, that they come out of the world uh, and begin to serve the Lord uh, with everything in their soul. Uh, that they're not so worldly minded uh, that they cannot see what God is doing. Help them to connect. Uh, help them to connect. Uh, help them to connect uh, right now. Now that's it to pray for them. It might be your child, it may be your wife, it may be your husband, it may be a friend, it may be somebody that you don't even know yet in the name of Jesus, but pray for them. Oh, I pray that we'll begin to pray all around this house, all around this sanctuary, all around this place. Even those that are watching, begin to pray, begin to pray, begin to intercede, begin to intercede and let the Lord have his way in your life. Yes, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. You don't know what destinies are being changed right now. You don't know what lives are being turned around right now. In the name of Jesus.